Millennium. Uh, tonight we have one roller coaster ride of uh, <laughs> one roller coaster ride of uh, new art. Uh, we have speaking uh, uh, John Thompson and Alison Craighead, uh, Nina Pope and Karen Guthrie, and uh, last but not least, uh, Carrie Young. So we're going to try and run through this as rapidly as possible because there's so much art to get through. We have a, a, a variety of uh, uh, fast forwarding through the uh, art, art world. Um, first up are uh, John Thompson and Alison Craighead. Uh, John Thompson teaches at the uh, Slade School of Art. He also teaches uh, uh, at the Ruskin School of uh, Drawing, and Drawing and Painting, and uh, also writes for Ice Storm magazine. Um, they have uh, um, uh, shown in such diverse locations as the uh, Walker Art Centre in M Minneapolis and uh, as part of the Interstanding Exhibition at Estonia, which is still on, so you can jump on a plane and go there after they've finished speaking, if you really feel up to it. Um, uh, and that's it. So, do you want to... Oh, uh, of course, I've got Alison. Alison is a researcher at uh, Westminster University. Is that right? Westminster University. Okay. Okay, so I think we're just going to do a bit of show and tell, really. Um, a few pieces of work that we've made over the last two or three years, and although, I mean, as, it, as it's error 404 not found, we'll be concentrating on things we've done on the internet, um, but we'll be also kind of trying to contextualise it uh, with a little bit of gallery stuff as well, just to get kind of some sense of the kind of thing we've been up to over the last three years. So, um, in that we've only got half an hour, we'll just do it. <laughs> okay. So, the first piece we're going to show is Trigger Happy. So, I'm just going to let it run for a bit, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. the installation version of uh, the piece we've made called Trigger Happy, so it's designed for a gallery space. Two, two, five, one. Two, one, one. Okay. Um, it's Space Invaders, and we've replaced the invaders with uh, a text by Michel Foucault called uh, What is the Author? Um, and in the gallery, uh, it's just a data projection onto a wall, um, there's a game pad, on a plinth and you just play the game. And you get this kind of relationship between people watching and uh, uh, the actual player. And what tends to happen is the player's not reading the text, but the viewers can get an overview of what's going on. And um, of course, the, the passive viewers, if you want to call them that, uh, um, actually start reading the text and it kind of destroys itself from the backwards towards the beginning. So you get this kind of odd interplay between the, the player in the gallery and the passive viewer um, and, and yes, and this is the internet version of Trigger Happy, which was actually how it was initially conceived to be online. So it's the same, pla it's the same game, same text. And uh, what we've tended to do over the years is, for us really, when we first started working online, we decided that the most important thing was to just to treat it like any other site-specific piece of art that we would do. So anything that we do that has a gallery version as well is always tweaked for either occasion. So in this case, when you shoot a word up, let's give it a go, you then get the opportunity here to click on the word, which will then take you to a search engine results from that words, and I think it's at Yahoo, but that, that doesn't really matter. So the, the point really is that, that 
the reason we made it was really about the fact that you spend so, many, so much time with hyperlinks online and looking for information, and then this pursuit of information. But actually, you just end up clicking manically and never actually reading anything. So if you actually go in the pursuit of finding out some information about the moment, moment in time, or a family moment, then you actually have to lose the game, in a sense. But we, we offer this little button that will take you back into the game. So you've got a choice. You can either just click away uh, without actually assimilating kind of the information you might find online, um, or you can actually leave the game environment and actually start getting some sort of um, return on your activity. And uh, did you mention about the fact of the eight levels? Oh Sorry. yeah, there's nine levels to the game, and it takes you through the whole text about authorship. We chose we chose that to, in an abridged manner, of course. Um, we, we chose that text simply because it, 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 it sort of questions the idea of authorship um, per se. And, uh, but of course, Michel Foucault was so kind of didactic in the way he wrote it. You know, his presence was so felt in that text um, that we felt it was kind of probably a good thing to just shoot, shoot up and break apart. And I think the one thing that's really noticeably missing um, from the online version is the sound track that we, we put in the gallery version. And they were, they're found uh, tunes or codes from the number stations, which are a part of the... So I keep uh, looking they're, away. They're, um, it's the upper shortwave band. They're these radio stations that just churn out numbers and no one really admits uh, to them existing. And so there's a whole load of conspiracy theory about them. So. A lot of the, the aspect, that, that, that was kind of like a Super Mario backing track kind of surrogate, um, but without uh, acknowledged authorship. Should we go to Weightless? Yeah, so I think the next piece we're going to do is called Weightless. And this was made in conjunction with the channel, I think about a year ago, or maybe a little bit longer. <laughs> from um, Explorer or Netscape. Whichever browser you go in, you get a giant N or a giant E taken from the browser window. And for us, we were trying to, we were trying to do something that was about movement, it was about television, and also about net culture. And we were actually looking, really, for something that was the equivalent to a test card. And we felt this was, this was our, our strongest icon so far. I mean, we were interested in interface design as well, to an extent, in that we wanted to make the whole body of this work um, accessible from one location, so that you're not kind of following that, clicking through CDs, you know, going from one place to another, sort of maze idea. Um, Can we get the sound up a little bit? Is that all right? Can we get it up a bit more? And what we used as the content um, was uh, animated GIFs taken from people's home pages uh, and transcripts from uh, chat lines in sort of GeoCities predominantly. So some were teen chat lines, some were kind of forties, pe meeting people, specialist programming chat lines, whatever. Um, and in this way to try and create a kind of almost televisual sensibility where the animated GIFs become like kind of little TV movies uh, the, with the subtitling um, and the MIDI files, which again were all found and taken from existing sites, uh, become like a kind of soundtrack. Should we just run it for a bit? And... Yeah. Should we get the sound up a little bit more? Because it's lovely. <laughs> we want the full joy of it all. A lot of things that interest us here. It was actually like places like GeoCities have been very, very influential in, our, in how we approach the internet now. And I th I th anyone who's been there 
It's a very cheesy but extraordinary environment where you, know, you have a whole town or village set up and you choose where you're going to inhabit. And as part of that process, you're encouraged or they encourage you to make a page. And by doing that, they set up huge libraries of animated GIFs and of uh, MIDI files. And for us, we just became increasingly aware that this was the equivalent of IKEA, really. They were like, these things become iconic on people's pages. They stamp them onto their pages and they become very, very overbearing. So it was very interesting to actually strip it all down into the kind of the decorative features of people's web pages. And to some extent, what we wanted to do was to still kind of keep them attached to some sense, the kind of emergent net culture from which they come, but also to put them in a relative vacuum, albeit still online, um, so that you kind of look at them in their own right, but also kind of knowing where they've come from. Every three minutes, a new MIDI file is loaded up, um, and there's about 60, and it just, which, whatever the soundtrack is that you hear, is dependent on the, the minute of the hour when you actually visit the site. I think the other thing that became apparent as well while we were making this was how quickly, I mean it's very obvious, but how quickly the whole online culture changes. Because now when I'm looking at this, it looks quite dated. And actually if you're going into a chat room now, um, you'll find that a lot of the language is now sprinkled with things that look like animated GIFs, so just single GIFs. Um, and then people start incorporating it into the language and it becomes like this hieroglyphic which is incredibly interesting. But look, you know, and now, because I've been looking at more animated guests recently, they have changed, they've become a lot more professional looking in, in the way of a greeting card, and quite a lot larger as well. Yeah, I think we're gonna press on. It's the sort of piece that kind of gathers weight the more you use it. It becomes quite nauseous, actually, after a while. Which might surprise you. OK, so what is the next piece we're going to show? Uh, I think we're going to go to a video. Yeah, so I think the next video we're going to show is a piece that we did uh, for Pandemonium. And it's... Um, I, it's a gallery it, work, so... Yeah, it's a gallery work, but we find it quite... Inter I think it really s deals with a lot of the form that we're working with online. So it's a user-led installation, so people actually kind of do something when they're in the space. Um, the video is only about three minutes long and, and we kind of are chatting on it, so we, it sort of explains itself. So I guess we just let the tape run. piece we've, we've got all the, the um, speakers behind a wall when you are just standing in the space you hear just this kind of noise this glossolalia kind of mass and then using a stethoscope you can pick out and um, get each single sound source and, and understand it it's just the idea of being able to pluck sounds out of the ether that excites mm. us that's mm. that's it really just the fact there's all this kind of information going over your head and mobile phones and I don't know, I don't actually believe it's really there. things from disparate geographical sources but where you are so you're physically somewhere and kind of virtually anywhere you know we try to make something that is 
a kind of analogue of what it might be like to be able to listen to the wall if the wall could pick up whatever it is that goes through the space that you're in at any time. One thing we found quite uh, that, that we sort of hoped would happen but weren't sure is the, the, the more people that used the wall, the more kind of marks it became. Um, so it kind of became this sort of self-creating map of the space. And over time, the most listened to kind of nodes or conversations became the grubbiest marks on the wall. Um, and, and it became easier and easier to read um, as a kind of surface when you're actually using it. I think, I think as well, the other thing that, that became very apparent with what we were doing is just with, with the advent of, of new technology in whatever form, you have to start reassessing your own kind of personal ethics on what actually is private space. And it, it's, it's something that, that's very interesting. Um, I think people just aren't aware how easy it is to listen into a mobile phone conversation, even unwittingly. Um, now scanners are sold virtually as toys to like young boys or young girls, and th th there isn't really anything done about it. And all you need really is a very um, good radio. Like we've got a we've got a, a clockwork radio at home, and I, I can actually tune into my neighbour's telephone conversations by accident when I'm looking for another station. And I think just with the increasing numbers of mobile phones, it, it becomes quite terrifying how much white noise there is out there. And how personal people think the space is when in fact it is about, um, it is as accessible as the internet. And also, you know, people feel that email is a very um, personal um, blah, 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 blah communications device or whatever we're going to call it, but it is so easy to um, break into, even accidentally. Um, if there's anything else we should say about it, I, I think in a way that the connection between what we've shown so far online and that partic particular gallery piece is that in most cases we've been taking existing data and manipulating it in some way, as opposed to loading up our sites or the gallery space with our own representations. And that's quite important to us because we feel that because so much information is, is now kind of in our faces, uh, there's a, it's a, a time of information overload. Um, the, that we um, that we are privy to so much data that uh, you could the sort of permutation of manipulating that amount of Im information becomes quite close to perhaps more traditional notions of representation. CNN. Yeah. So it's another web piece. Um, it's a simple intervention where we've added functionality to the CNN website if you visit it. So it'll just take a wee while to download the CNN CNN's site. a really big site, so it kind of does tend to. But all we've actually done is uh, popped a little console up um, where you can choose an audio mood when you're actually browsing your news. So you could be jubilant or disaster or anything in between. Um, and the idea is obviously that it highlights the kind of inherent distortions uh, that exist in supposedly unbiased news coverage. So, so what do you feel like today? Upbeat. Upbeat, <laughs> okay. disaster really considering the headline. So I mean what I enjoy about this piece and this is this, so far this is actually my favorite piece that we've made online is the fact that you can it's it's such a small device but it has such a big change on the site for me and I think that it also you know it's not so far out what could actually happen in a few months considering this, their own CNN shop. 
I mean, I think that's quite thick, actually, but, you know, I, it would be an idea that I would come up with to do an intervention to put a CNN shot, but actually, you know, they've gone and done it. Um, what, another, another thing we're thinking about when constructing this piece, apart from, again, it being a manipulation as opposed to a representation, uh, was to use the MIDI files, which are kind of somewhat anodyne and, and mediated, which, of course, everything on the internet is, is very highly mediated in, in a way that is difficult um, for us as end users to authenticate or the, the validity of the information. So generally online, you know, it's up to us to decide whether something is valuable or uh, truthful or whatever. And that, of course, extends and has always been the case anyway. Uh, and CNN is a sort of hybrid, it's a halfway in a way. It's an authoritative space, but it is in the mediated environment of the internet. Okay, so actually we better move on because we've got another five minutes. So it's going to show another videotape of... All right. Oh, ten minutes. Well, we've got two more pieces, so five minutes each. So th the next piece we're going to do is actually talking about CNN shopping. This is our own little shopping piece. So this, uh, this is a piece that is a gallery uh, piece and it's, it's very rough documentation. So it, it'll just give you an idea of the gallery, what we've been making most recently. So we actually made this piece with the support of Take a Break magazine. Not the colour bars, but... No, we managed to colour bars by ourselves. And they actually allowed us into a supermarket while they were um, doing one of their shopping riots, as they call them. So, yeah, take a break, call it a supermarket riot, but it's effectively a trolley dash. They, they, there were about four people who had four minutes to get as much stuff as they could in a safe way in uh, Loughton, in Essex. Um, and what we did is we took uh, three aisles and we shot the four minutes action and then we represented it in the gallery as a kind of fairly traditional video triptych. Uh, and it's synchronous so that people moving from aisle to aisle is actually uh, discernible when you're in the space. Um, and we slowed it down quite a lot and uh, uh, the sound as well with it um, so that this kind of competition becomes again open to scrutiny. Uh, in a way, I suppose, um, you get a kind of almost anthropological gaze. Yeah, it was actually very terrifying because the men went for fresh meat and the ladies went for toiletries. And the, 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 it really was. The ladies went for washing powder and toiletries and the men went for chocolate, but mainly fresh meat. But because it was slowed down so much, you get this rather ambivalent narrative kind of uncovering where sometimes you look at one aisle and it looks maybe like it's a kind of robbery. If we come, as it kind of slowly pans the middle, you'll see that a photographer for the magazine comes down and starts taking pictures. So you get this kind of odd interplay between what exactly is the story here. Yeah, here she comes. And this is something we didn't expect at all. So we were really shocked when it was happening. Um, that she was going to come in and we were very upset about it at the time but now she actually adds in a different element into the piece where you realise that something is very wrong and it's somehow very contrived, the whole situation. So by the end of the 11 minutes, which is how long it takes with the slowed down version, this aisle is so trashed, it's unbelievable. Yeah, a lot of what we were trying to do um, with this piece was actually just to manipulate, um, well not manipulate, to utilise a lot of the traditions in video art, especially monumental video art. So we kind of looked very carefully at Bill Viola, Gary Hill's kind of majorly monumental pieces and tried to use very similar tactics like slow-mo, black and white, taking the sound down. Um, and that, that was something else that was quite interesting for us, just to carry on, like, trying to utilise the language of the, the gallery. Um, th th thanks, that's probably plenty of video. So the last piece we're going to show is called Browser Archaeology. And it's being shown in the Walker Arts Centre in Minneapolis, and it's going to be touring. Um, they well, it's, it's a bit of a kind of funny thing. It's actually it's a, a thing called Artists Entertainment Network, which is a website, uh, but it's attached to a gallery show that kind of 
does the rounds over the course of about two years. It's another game paradigm that we've used, uh, but this time instead of Space Invaders, it's Breakout. And the gameplay starts normally. Oops, a bit Ooh, fast. Maybe not. I think there's sound coming off this as well. Would it be possible to get that up? I put the wrong one in. You put the wrong. Um, we, we've got yeah, we've got a few versions. It's our offline version. We might be better doing this online because obviously. Ooh. Well, we'll let it run. It's anyway. You get you get the idea. If not a little rapidly. Um, the normal gameplay starts and uh, after a certain amount of time, the browser itself starts to break up. Very quickly in this instance. If you lose a life. Right. Um, it, you'll just bounce to a random URL. What we're actually trying to do at the moment is uh, make it so that instead of being um, unearthing a site from the internet at large, you actually start to retrospect uh, and it unearths uh, documents from your brow uh, browser history. So as the gameplay unfolds, you'll be become reminded of what you were looking at a week ago, two weeks ago, a month ago, whatever. And you'll get your whole journey that has been that you've had on your computer, uh, scrolling up on the screen. But that will be at the stage where, actually, you'll have got broken away. I'm just not winning on this. John's going to give it a go. The text, the text behind, is actually, is actually the source code of the Netscape browser. So, yeah, I'll use the pad. And what we're hoping for as well is the fact, the fact that very soon this, this browser that we, we've made is going to be outdated. So the whole thing is going to become more and more dated. So not only are you going to have your own personal history, but you're going to have a very old browser as well. And I can imagine by the end of you know, the two years, we'll have gone up quite a few browsers by then. I think the other thing, we've had, with, the, with the browser that dissolves or falls apart. It, we've made it so it's fully functional. So you can type in URLs and you can um, go to another site on it. And um, We've been beaten by our own game here. But this, this, gives us an this gives you an idea of where we're wanting to go on further. We're wanting to, to work more on um, and working with a, a browser and actually trying to dismantle it more or actually just look at the, more of the framing that the browser does to work. Yeah, so I think that, that yeah, yeah, I know, being defeated by our own game just outsped us. So hopefully that gives you a, a bit of an idea of the kind of thing that we're up to, as anyways, and, and some of the things that actually interest us online. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Next in our rapid uh, fire is uh, Nina Pope and Karen Guthrie. Uh, they both studied at uh, Edinburgh Art School. Edinburgh Art School? I hope you pronounce it. Um, uh, Nina has uh, worked in various places like the Bart School of Architecture and the uh, Royal College of Art. Uh, maybe it, um, they've, uh, uh, Karen ha is currently teaching at Birmingham University, I believe, and um, they have ed uh, exhibited in such places as the uh, ICA and Bury St Edmunds. <laughs> Should we get you two up? <coughs> We, we normally have a kind of complex double act routine, but actually this evening we're just going to talk about one project each. Do we have a slide thing? Or do we yeah, use that thing there. Can we have the slides first? Okay, to go forward there. To give you a bit of a, a brief um, history, we've done about um, probably four or five large scale collaborative projects together, starting in about 94, 95. Um, and we originally started to work together really um, because of kind of dissatisfaction, I suppose, with the sort of um, work we'd be making independently and the kind of, um, I suppose, traditional media that we were kind of stuck in using. And it was at a time where uh, 
technology wasn't really taught to fine art students in art schools in, in London. And we were pretty much self-taught and still are. And I think moving into works where technology had a higher profile was kind of a, a, a step that we, m we might not have been able to make independently. So the trajectory of working collaboratively has kind of increased for lots of reasons. And, and now we do a lot of work um, in partnership. So the first, we're going to only talk about two projects because it tends to be quite difficult for us to explain what's going on in them. So it's kind of a bit easier if we just hone it right down to I think these two. So this one's called An Artist's Impression. And it, was, it is ongoing, and it was ongoing before this kind of resting point that you're looking at here um, for about two years. So this is an installation shot from the ICA, which some of you might recognize. It's the ground floor. And uh, this was in October of last year. And what you're looking at is um, probably the last thing you expect to see when you think about um, what a digital artwork might look like. And, and that's kind of, that is deliberate. And I think um, the framework of the exhibition it was in, which was the, the Cap Gemini Digital Art Prize, gave people a certain expectation of this piece, which was kind of confounded on arrival and um, resulting in sort of various responses, I think, from an audience who were expecting to be able to click on a mouse mice when they came into the space and not sort of have to look at a, a thing. So um, what you're looking at really is a model, obviously, and it's about eight meters by about five meters. And in the corner there, there is one of two sort of workshops um, furnished with kind of materials that you might make the island out of, but also with a small sort of iMac type, was it an iMac? Yeah, kind of Mac that was connected to the internet. So you kind of came into the space and had a feeling that those corners were private. I'm going to zoom right into a detail of the island at the moment and talk a bit about um, the origins of the project. Um, when you came into the space in the ICA, I think you had um, some hunch that something was going on in those workshop corners. And essentially what you saw in them was Nina and I kind of building, looking at the internet every so often and building these little things that would go on the model. And um, we were obviously um, referring to something to build this model. So you kind of had a sort of live art, I suppose, experience as well as being able to look at this large sculpture. And um, what we were actually looking at in that, it, on those internet connections was a mush that we've built, which is very much the sort of other side of this project, which perhaps is less visible. And um, that, was the, that was the side of the project that has been developing the longest. Um, the island at the moment is simply kind of a resting point for the project at the moment, and, and it will change and develop, hopefully. And the mush itself was the thing that we kind of based that island on. So we were quite interested, I suppose, we have been interested throughout all our work, and in the piece that Nina's going to talk about as well. We've been quite interested in looking at, um, I suppose, the dark corners of technology and the kind of forgotten bits of it, and the historic bits of it, I suppose, in a way as well. So. Oh yeah, a mush. Well, uh, yeah, a mush is, stands for a multi-user shared hallucination. So I'll, I'll talk a bit about that because what we're actually going to do is go into the mush that Nina and I have built, so you can sort of see what I mean by that. I realise it's a really sort of mind-bending thing to talk about without going into it, so we will do that. Um, yeah, so we were um, looking at these kind of corners of technology, and one of the parts of the internet that is the least changed uh, since its inception is is mush. Um, text-based environments, I suppose you would say. A bit like chat spaces, but instead of simply having social interaction, there's a lot of emphasis on building. And when I say building, what I actually mean is text programming. Um, build, building up, as if you like, a kind of textual description of a space through scrolling text on a screen. Um, do you want to bring that up, actually? Yeah, could you bring the computer? Yeah. So Nina and I, about six, well, probably longer than that, about nine months ago, actually built our own mush. And we're going to go sort of and log into that just so you can see what I mean by a, a text-based community, or environment, rather. I'm on the village green. <laughs> She's on the village green. She's telling me. So you can see it's like a very impoverished interface, quite different from the model in the, in the gallery. And Nina's wandering around in a village. So if any of you have been into these spaces, you'll know that on the whole they are quite heavily themed. You have a lot of um, kind of gaming ones based on Dungeons and Dragons, etc. 
and you have um, places where tiny sex occurs, that's quite a large sector of the market. And you have ones where um, very high tech kind of discussions take place. And lots of them are very banal. And we were very interested in this imaginary compulsion that people have in these spaces. They're very heavily used, particularly in the States. We're really interested in what, what was it about this really kind of crutty, in a way, kind of interface that made people go back to these things and, and sort of use them almost like an interactive book. And as visual artists, this was particularly kind of confounding. I mean, why were people so interested in them? And where are they visualizing the space as they move through them? And if so, how? So we spent a lot of time actually communicating with people who use these mushes a great deal before we actually got to the point in the project that you're seeing now. Uh, and in doing so, we met somebody called Alan Schwartz, who's based in Chicago, who has become the lead program on our mush. Because um, Nina and I, despite trying to learn, have, have been very slow and despite now running a mush, which is a sort of position of some power, um, are very te technically dependent on, on other people to help us. So um, you might think um, you get to the point of running a mush, but what do you put in it? And bearing in mind what was the driving force for us was what is this relationship between visual imagination and visual illustration, in a, in a sense, and a kind of imaginary textual space? So we always had the idea it would be visualized, but what would we actually put in the text space in order to kind of kickstart the project? And alongside other sort of bits of work we've done, we decided to very much start from a kind of personal, almost sort of domestic position, where what we built uh, on our mush space, so this is, when I say build, I mean text encoding, was two communities. Um, sort of a village on one side and a coastal town on the other. And the coastal town is where you arrive on when you come to the island as a new visitor. So the coastal town was built on, based on my, um, I suppose, personal memory of where I used to live. Yeah, that's cool. Can we go back to the slides? And the village was based on where Nina was brought up. So what we essentially did to kind of kickstart action on it was, if you can imagine, to kind of map one's own personal memory through a text description into this space. And um, that's simply done by sort of describing what you might see as you turn through various directions in that text space. And um, in that sense, the origins of the project are very, very personal. But as a user or a game player, you can come on and actually navigate around those communities very, very um, freely and hopefully begin to build. And um, that's what happened, just particularly during the ICA show, because there was a lot of kind of interest in the, in the project. So we have these two communities which Nina and I essentially built the skeletons of, which are based on our memory, and which other users have come on and actually built onto. So what we're showing you here is one of the first settlements that it was uh, very easy if you were a new player to come in and build in, and those are caravans. So to encourage new users to our space, we actually made some um, bits of coding very easy to use. And one of them was the caravans, where you could settle as a new player. And that's a detail of them there. Um, this is a car park. Um, you'll notice that it's lit up at the moment. And that, that's basically because in the mush, in the text space, the programming was such that it changes as we go into nighttime in British time. So when you wander around on the uh, town centre, for example, if you're there at 5.30 PM, you'll actually find that all the text descriptions you move around will change and you'll be in a kind of depressing, wet coastal town at night with chip wrappers flying around instead of being in this kind of nice uh, utopian environment during the day. So that's Nina working away in the corner there, um, looking, at the, looking at the marsh, I think. Yeah, the top of the, the middle of the island, rather, it lifts off in a kind of James Bond style um, so you can access sort of inner, inner elements of it. And we, we, during the ICA, we were quite free about just lifting that up and kind of wandering around underneath it and leaving it there. And the electronics on the model are actually controlled from that space as well. One of the most complex programmed things on the mush is a train that you can actually take to take you over the space. And uh, as you can imagine, building this on an island which was already quite developed was very tricky and it caused a sort of huge scar on the, on the island to evolve at the ICA, and this is Nina trying to patch up the damage. We never really got the train to work as well, which is kind of a, a, bit, of a <laughs> bit of a problem, really. 
And that's kind of long shot down the coastal area where you could walk um, after logging on. So I want, you know, I want to just talk a bit about um, the community, the mush community, and why, in a set, why does the visualization of this mush look a bit like a model railway, which is something that is so, it seems so natural to us now that we, we are almost not aware of it. But a lot of people have questioned that, and why doesn't it look like an architectural model, for example? And I, I would go back to really the kind of experience we had doing the first sort of research for the project, which was about really getting to know the mush community and what it was about um, the mush that was, was kind of compelling to people. And it was very much the, the kind of exchange of information, the sort of currency of craft that you have within these spaces. If you can't technically program, you're like a nobody in them. Um, so Nina and I, are, uh, kind of came into these environments, I guess, as complete novices and had to teach ourselves from scratch how to program and how to move around in them. And it was very, very, um, I suppose, um, yeah, it made you feel quite small again, I think. It kind of disempowered you of the things that you normally have to hand as your abilities as an artist. And a lot of the work we do together sort of um, takes a position where we're already set back from what we perhaps are familiar with. And this is quite a good example of that. We wanted to sort of put the skills that we thought we had to one side and have to learn from scratch again how to actually do something. And um, it's an amateur, largely an amateur kind of culture mushing, and people do it simply for the love of it. So this was, this was really compelling to us, and the, the way people actually helped us to build our mush as well was very, you know, really quite touching and, and, and a sort of interesting part of technology culture, I suppose, on the web. And so we're looking around for a kind of visualization equivalent of that culture in a way, because we knew that we wanted to explore what it would be like to interpret continuously what was going on in this real-time space. And so we looked around for a long time for visualization sort of mode until we came up with this one. And really, when we came up with it, it felt like the unit was kind of going into place, really, because it seemed so spot on in that the model railway world is exactly like the mush world. It's a community of people who learn through exchange, free exchange of, of, of techniques and sort of information and knowledge. It has an amateurish base. It also has a largely male base, which I'm not even going to go into there because I, I don't know what that means. But <laughs> and it has a kind of shruddiness as well. I mean, there's, there's a lot of parallels which I think made the project feel quite um, well combined when we found that way of visualizing the space. And for us also, it meant that we had to learn how to do it. We, we went to model railway clubs. We made a hash of parts of our island. We did things very badly. And we still are doing them very badly. We're still learning very, vis very um, visibly on this model as we worked at the ICA. And it was great, because we would, ha we would have visitors who were just interested in the mush, for example. But also, we'd have people who were just interested in seeing how we'd done a large-scale model railway layout. And that kind of notion of an audience which is diverse and quite complex is, is very interesting to us and something that we always think about when we're making work. This little slide here is just a detail of a building site that began to occur. Oh yeah, and this is a zoo built by a player um, who began to develop the polar parade, it was called. Um, it, had, it, actually, oh, it doesn't have the polar bear on it there, but I actually did put a polar bear on that. <laughs> so it was, quite, it was quite a demanding project to be involved in as a user. You had to learn how to play on the mush. And I think a lot of people who came to the ICA didn't realize that and thought it was a case of sending us a little email about what they wanted to see on the island. And it wasn't like that at all. And I think that's another sort of expectation, I think, of digital art exhibitions, is that they're easy to use and have a very kind of clickable interface. And this one sent a few people away, I think, quite disappointed because they couldn't just sit down at our computers and send us the plans for an airport or something like that. Th these last slides are just showing you what it looked like right at the beginning of the ICA the changes by the end, although unfortunately <laughs> due to the many. distance on the slide you can't really see them. There's more changes at the other end. Most people built in this kind of, uh, the, in the town end of the yeah. island. So this model's actually in storage at the moment, but um, as the mush is a sort of real-time ongoing space and in a sense has its own history, which is what's so interesting about working with it, um, this model will hopefully kind of come out of storage and be exhibited again and be changed. I should say that we very quickly after the ICA show, we had a massive data crash, which is kind of a, a, a sort of risk of working this way, which looks like it was terminal. Um, the way things are going, I think it was terminal. And it meant that actually all the new players and all the new buildings from the ICA were um, eradicated. 
So we're now in a position where it's kind of H.G. Wells time machine conundrum. You've got to decide whether to destroy what, what has happened in the meantime and go back to a previous version or actually just, um, I guess, kind of raise some of the island to the ground and start again. But it's quite kind of interesting problem this piece because it, it goes on without our control and it goes on when we're not like it's going on now and we're not in control of it and it's exactly like when um, when you said about your game being beaten by your own game I very often feel like this about about this project I feel beaten by it by the sort of enormity of it and the fact that it's happening and um, it's at risk almost you know when we're not looking after it and it's also got a very personal, imaginary sort of origin for Nina and I, so it's, it's quite a strange piece in that way because of the way it evolved very personally to do with our own memory. And to have it so publicly accessible on the web is quite a sort of odd situation. OK, um, so last yeah. summer, at the same time as working on that project, we were working on another piece, which was for... Um, can just stay opposite the, new, you can stay opposite. <laughs> the new Tate Bank side. Um, the Tate obviously are opening this new, new fantastic branch, and in order to try and uh, placate the community that live around that area, they've That's made several kind of ham-fisted attempts at public art. So we were commissioned to make um, a piece which had art at its centre mm -hmm. and took place in Borough Market, which some of you might have been to. I can see James is at the back of the audience there. So you might want to leave. It might be too painful to relive <laughs> some of this. Um, so the piece that we came up with was called Broadcast, 29 Pilgrims, 29 Tales, and it played on the fact that Chaucer's Pilgrims originally fictitiously left from the Tabard Inn in Southwark, which is very near the existing site of Borough Market. And so what Karen and I proposed for our piece was to advertise for 29 contemporary pilgrims who would go off on journeys of their own choosing for a 24-hour period to different locations um, and would broadcast back at a given time their, their tale on the day and that these tales would be webcast live on the day and also kind of presented at, in a sort of performance um, environment live in the market. So um, if, can I just flick to the computer for a sec? I'll just start by showing you the website. The website, in fact, has only just been finished with uh, real media encoded files, thanks, thanks to James at the back for that, <laughs> um, of the actual tales from the day. So what you're seeing is actually quite a recently completed site, but um, during the event, there was a web space where you could actually go and browse all this. So on the day, basically, you could see the schedule of the day with all the different pilgrims' names, and you could go to a page and access other details about them. But you could also see a live stream of the video that was, that was happening in the market. And now, if you go into the pages, you can play either people's prologues um, or their actual tales. I'm just going to show you a bit of this, because it's working so beautifully on the projector. <laughs> Or is it? Or is it? No, that's the that's the one that I get. Go to a different one. What's quite nice about these, because um, people presented their tales via telephone. The real media files work particularly well. There's something quite compelling about hearing somebody's voice over the telephone. So even though it's quite kind of crappy quality, it works quite well with the, with the phone kind of style of the interviews. Although I've picked one now where she starts by not talking down the phone, of course. Seven years ago, I passed my driving limit, yeah? And I was very happy about that. And then I passed it after a therapy session. I'd already failed one. I knew a hypnotherapist who told me that it was completely failed to me, that if I had a hypnotherapist position with him. Okay, I just wanted to show you the website briefly so you could get a kind of feel for it, but I'm going to go back to the slides now because I actually find it very difficult to talk and operate the website at the same time. Um, so, yeah, the project started by us interviewing all the people who applied to be pilgrims, and uh, this is one of them in our studio. And I just thought I'd run through some of the different people that we chose in the end. This is Philippa Venn Brown, who is an uh, Chaucer, Australian Chaucer scholar who worked as a nurse in a cancer ward. And she went to Canterbury to see some medieval tombs she'd been researching. She's a fantastically uh, buoyant and very knowledgeable person about Chaucer, which is very helpful to us. 
This is Richard Guest, who was the person who worked at the Tate, who projected the silhouette of his nose onto a map of London and walked around the outline of it on his pilgrimage. This is uh, Barbara, our oldest pilgrim at 64, was 69. she? 69 who went to visit a tall ship in Southampton that she'd helped to do some building on, having had a kind of cathartic experience going on a trip on a tall ship in her retirement. Uh, this is Jerome Fletcher, who rowed down the Thames on a Venetian boat and told a very kind of complex interwoven story which related to death, his father, all kinds good, of different yeah. things. It's a good tale. This is Steve Ireland, who told the van driver's tale. He went back to his former childhood home in Corringham in Essex. And I think, I mean, his, in a way, his tale represented a journey that many people make, in some regarding it as a pilgrimage, some others not. But sort of, I think, maybe probably people in the audience all kind of thought about what it would mean for them to go back to somewhere they'd lived previously. This is Bankside Beauty. Our biggest team of pilgrims, who were from the local beauty parlour in Southwark, Karen went to have her legs waxed and made the fatal mistake of actually telling them what we were doing when they said, what else are you doing today? And uh, they signed up for the project. They went to Hampton Court based on a tarot reading they'd done. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to play you one of the prologues. For each person, we made a short video portrait of them based on their interview, which kind of talked a little bit about them, a little bit about what they were going to do on the day. So if you, in the day, on the market, if you heard some music and saw a prologue playing, you knew another tale was going to come on. So could you play the next video? You got a long shot of the market? Yeah. yeah. If any of you saw my piece Safe Bet, you might recognise the person who's this pilgrim. Can you turn the sound up? We should say that actually not only did we develop the tale on the website in collaboration with each pilgrim, we also developed this music um, with them and the composers, um, Tim and Matthew Olden, worked with each pilgrim to actually evolve a bit of music that they felt conveyed what they wanted to say. So it was a bit like collaborating with 29 people throughout. So this is him getting ready to be interviewed about why he should be a pilgrim, so he's a little bit nervous, shifting around in his chair. My name is Ed Nicholson. I'm public relations manager for Labbrooks during the daytime and nighttime. Um, and I, my pilgrimage is called, entitled, The Punter's Tale. Um, it's all about travelling up to Aintree Racecourse at Liverpool to see Red Rum's grave. Uh, Red Rum, the famous racehorse from the 70s who won three Grand Nationals and was placed twice. Uh, no other horse has done that. Uh, and really, on the way, I'll be telling hopefully interesting tales uh, of my connection with Red Rum, um, how he's touched my life. One thing that is probably sacred to me is my love of horse racing. And um, everybody, even if they don't like horse racing, have heard of Red Rum. All throughout my life, I've, all, all throughout my life up to when he died, or even now I suppose, it, I, I've been connected to Red Rum in some way. Um, most, most kids, I don't know, playing football, you know, putting a pin up to their favourite pop star. I mean, I, I had a jigsaw of red rum, and I used to, I used to, I put it together, I glued it together, I stuck it on the wall. I used to write magazines. Even when I got to be about 24, 25, my, my grand would Some phone up and say, "Some of the most compelling reading I've had in a so long I'd, time." So I'd actually get my computer and just do them and send them up to her. When Red Rum was going to run in his final Grand National, 1978, I went up and stayed with my relations in North Wales to go with my dad to watch the race. And the eve of the night, he was pulled out of the race. And it was devastating blow to me because I wanted to go and see him run, and uh, so I never saw it. I never saw him actually run live. So uh, you know, that was always a, a discomfort to me. Thanks. Can we go back to the slides? So I just kind of romped through a description of what it was like on the day. This is us looking slightly haggard in the market on the day. Basically, there was a kind of small stage area where we would be standing, kind of pre presenting, and quite a kind of made obvious reference to TV, um, but there was also this kind of big technology area which was all kind of revealed to the audience and the idea was that people would be able to walk around and kind of see all the stuff that was going on. 
and uh, behind the desk that you could see the feeds coming in from all the different cameras and you could see the stuff going off onto the big screen on the left but also out onto the web as part to be webcast essentially. And then most of the pilgrims told their tales remotely just via a phone link and you could hear their voice coming out in the market and we would be chatting to them. And then we had visuals and stuff prepared for them which would come up on the big screen. And then a few of them, this is Gwen who did the shopper's tale, um, basically went on this walk back to somewhere she'd lived previously and collected objects in her trolley. She came back and actually presented her tale live in the market. So it was a kind of mixture of people coming in remotely for their slots and coming in live. This is Jerome, who I was saying went on the boat trip doing his live. And then towards the end of the day, it got more and more chaotic as pilgrims were arriving back whilst others were still telling their tales. This is Phil Jones, who did the scientist tale where he went to Bogner Regis, the site where the astronauts and cosmonauts shook hands during the 1970s kind of space race program. Uh, he actually works for the British Antarctic Survey, but he decided he'd like to go to Bogner for his pilgrimage. And uh, on, one side of the, on the other side of the market, um, to where all the sort of tech stuff was happening, there was a kind of cafe area where you could look at the website and find out other information about the pilgrims. But also there were these cases with lots of objects that the pilgrims had given us over the weeks kind of running up to the project. And then in the evening, once the... Uh, Pilgrims all came back. The market became a kind of slightly more private space, and we had this feast, as happens in the Canterbury Tales, with just us and the 29 pilgrims. So I'm just going to finish by playing a tiny bit of video from what it actually kind of looked like on the day, and then uh, we'll stop after that, and Kerry can come on. Okay, so our next pilgrim coming back is going to be Gwen, the shopper, and I'd quite like to flip over to a live radio phone link with her to see how far away she is and whether I should walk out the market to go and meet her. Hint, cameras. <laughs> you just dialing you can her see the sheer That's professionalism great. of the day. And the other thing I'd quite like Completely to point untrained. out is, if anyone can follow me, <laughs> Over in the cases here is the fantastically elaborate display that Gwen's done of where she's going on her route, on her pilgrimage. So, starting from our studio in Borough Market here, with her shopping trolley. These are the baggages that she's taking with her to give to people as tokens on her pilgrimage. That's Gwen. This is, a, I believe, the house that she used to live in as a child, and I can only guess that that must be her. And you can see her routes marked by all these red dots leading down to destination 21 Farnaby Road, which is where she's walked there and back. Okay, apparently we've got her on the line, so I just want to come over and check where she is and whether I can to meet her. Hello, Gwen, it's Nina. Oh, hi, Nina. I'm just outside. I'm trying to cross a rather busy road at the moment, so I've got to take okay. my time. I'm going to make my way out to try and meet you then, and hopefully right. the cameras will follow us. Okay, right. I'm, I'm sort of making my way over. Okay. And Lizzie's... I'm fairly unmissable with my trolley. Lizzie's ready on set with the box to put the objects on. This so, particular Tim, bit kind of sums music, up please? what we hoped would happen a lot more on the day, the kind of mad chaos right. mix so, of I'm assuming you're live coming TV, in the main entrance. Because otherwise we're going yeah. to really kind of, annoy the so camera you, crew. So if you're walking through the market, you might be quite confused about what it was you'd come into. There's some confused looking people looking at the sign, is all I can see at the moment. Yeah. I'm just coming up to the entrance. It's got um, the banner with broadcast over it. Okay, and, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, here I am. Yeah, you are. <laughs> on your phone. I think we could put your phone off now. Hi, okay. Together, fantastic. Well done. Amazing. Trainers still looking very, very new. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Listed, though. Oh, dear. Plenty of listed. <laughs> We'll try on some daytime television there. Um, moving swiftly onwards, uh, Kerry Young graduated with an MA in photography from the Royal College of Art in 1997. Since then, she's done very little photography um, and worked in a variety of media, including video, performance, and sculpture. 
She showed recently at the ICA, the Photographer's Gallery, and the Chisendale Gallery. Uh, and her work is uh, now on as part of the um, Continuum exhibition at the CCA in Glasgow. So, Carrie, if you'd like to come up. Hi. <laughs> Could I have um, the slides up, please? Right. Um, I've got to say, before I kind of kick off, that I, the, the, the general pretext for this evening's talk is very much about um, digital art. Um, I've got to say, I don't see myself in any sense as a digital artist. I'm not sure what a digital artist is, but I'm really not comfortable with that term for myself. Um, I thought recently, well, what, what medium do I actually use the most? What tool is most important to me? Um, and the only thing I could really think of that consistently was a pattern was um, a mobile phone but there's no uh, term for mobile phone artists, so um, I, I probably use the term communications um, as my, my broad interest. Um, I'm very interested in technology, but I don't like working with it. Um, and in fact, one of my long-term interests has been um, around how do you understand technology? You know, it's something that people feel is quite alien to them um, and perhaps something they feel kind of concerned about. Um, particularly in the way it's kind of, well, I, I look at that as, as the fault of the people that kind of um, dis decide on the names, the terminology, um, the packaging of it, um, which is very, very particular. Uh, and in the West, certainly, it's very much around speed um, rather than perhaps notions of c community or, or, you know, more human um, aspects. Um, and of course, most people, I think, generally do think of technology as dehumanizing and have a, a worry about that. So my work um, for the last uh, few years has been very much about trying to find um, spaces for a more human um, approach to technology. Um, and not to say that in a kind of whimsical fashion, but very much about um, human emotions, uh, loss, failure, being outside, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> So the first set of work I want to show you is the work I showed as my graduation um, show at the Royal College. Um, a set of photographs which I called Wired, um, named after the magazine, um, but very much not about the success uh, of the digital era, the gloss and the glitter of um, the networks. Very much about the kind of what's outside to that. What, what can we connect to technology that, that feels more familiar um, and perhaps helps us to understand uh, this huge, great information era that, um, you know, is upon us. So what I did was um, photographed something that I noticed first outside my front door, which is um, these little wires, um, which are the, um, the fiber optic cables that are being laid, that were being laid then, um, but which carry the data um, on its route around the network, uh, and in fact would form a slightly dated term now, but the information superhighway. Um, and when you look at it, they're, they're tiny, um, but of course they're carrying this huge cultural weight, uh, that, that huge weight, especially now, you know, entering the new millennium, uh, all the news um, and the kind of importance con connected to the internet, I think cannot now be uh, ignored or rejected. So. Um, you know, I'm very interested in, in the fact that this is, this is the, the internet, um, but we're looking at it on a very, very small uh, and local scale. Uh, and these wires are actually severed from the network. Um, so in, in one sense, they're kind of rejects, they're failures, they're the things that didn't make it, but they're nevertheless within our human physical domain. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Oh, sorry, it's me, isn't it? So what I actually, could somebody focus that a little bit? For? Oh, it's not DIY, okay. Oop. Is it? Not when you're a photographer. Okay. Right, what I actually did was approach um, the making of these images by thinking about the, the theory that surrounds technology, and for anyone that's sort of looked into this, there's an awful lot of it. Um, an awful lot of kind of metaphors that get 
attached to technology from a sort of philosophical perspective. So thinking about technology and the body, you know, reams and reams has been written about that. So I wanted to approach this whole body of work um, by thinking about those, those ways of interpreting technology, but using photography to actually actualize that and make it literal, to poke, poke those connections a bit, make them too literal and, and see whether they fitted. So here, you know, thinking about technology and the body, um, does that feel appropriate? If technology is photographed as if it was some kind of body part, um, does that seem appropriate? Does it seem disgusting, or, or can we, as humans, relate to something that also looks like flesh and blood? Perhaps this is, a, I would think of this as a little digital community. Um, these works were actually um, shown at a size which is probably quite similar to how they're projected now. So the, the works are actually quite physical in themselves. Um, and they're, they're printed on, they're mounted onto aluminium, so they've got a kind of definite physical presence. Um, so with these, all of these, it's more about what associations we'd pin onto these images rather than what these wires are, are actually, or what they're doing. You know, this happens to be wires spilling out of some kind of plastic cabling, but I, I, you know, to me, I don't think that's very interesting. I think it's more interesting in terms of the, the associations that are thrown up here. Um, and of course, you can then, you realize that you're making that projection of meaning. And I think then it becomes more transparent that we, we do project things onto, onto technology, perhaps what we want or what we're worried about. A theme running through my work as a whole is that technology, you know, cannot be seen as necessarily the new. Um, you know, it's an ancient drive within humans to create tools. Um, these happen to be our perhaps most important contemporary tools, although many might argue with that. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm much more interested in the kind of the, the, the ongoing links that can be made between what we would consider new technology and older ways of thinking. You know, I mean, and also I think, you know, as a comment I'd ask to um, everyone that might consider themselves digital artists or working with this media, how do you make work about technology that, that doesn't date with the tools that you make it on? Um, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, for me that, that, was, that was a question that made me not want to make work on the internet, um, but to use other media to approach the same issues, the same, the same world, if you like. So thinking about technology and the, and the city, and it's quite interesting hearing about geocities um, from John and Alison. You know, technology in the city is something that's been written about a huge amount. Um, it's a connection in space, and then the city being a metaphor that's connected with the internet very, very often. I think I'll shut up now because it's much more about what people read into these than, than what I think they're about. Mm, that's upside down. I've got to say these are, I'm very embarrassed to say, um, upside down.
Right, um, this is another project. Um, and this is actually a sculpture project. Um, this is the next project I did after leaving college. Um, I do tend to work across many different media, as I'm sure I've mentioned several times now. Um, and I also tend to work collaboratively with other people and to make people and, and multiple multiplications of thought about the same thing um, part of the work. And with this, um, I, I wanted to work with um, computer hackers. I've collaborated with um, science fiction writers in the past to make kind of joint visual artworks, people like William Gibson and J.G. Ballard. Um, with this, I wanted to work with computer hackers because I think they're really fascinating in terms of their intense knowledge about computer networks. Um, in some senses, they're the architects of the internet. Um, they've been extremely important in designing and creating the tools and also creating the, the background um, freedom, if you like, a freedom of information elements of the internet. Um, they're extremely important, I believe. And also, of course, um, if you read the media, they're cyber terrorists. Um, so they're, they're, they're people that have got uh, international government figures rather worried about the safety of their data and their networks. Um, <clears throat> so they're kind of contentious body of people, but also rather mysterious. Um, and I wanted to look at them in terms of their, their knowledge about technology and perhaps to bring that out a bit. Um, so to, in, in, in order to kind of provoke some kind of debate about, around technology and what it is and what we think about it. So what I actually asked them to do was to work in a medium which is completely untechnological and about as physical um, as, as you could try and be. So um, that was actually clay. Um, so what you're seeing here are actually um, some tools which may be familiar from um, primary school. Um, these are tools for making shapes and, and designs on clay. Now this, this is documentation. So these are just kind of snapshots of what, um, what people actually made. I have to point out. And this is actually work in progress. So this is not how it would be shown in a gallery. But I just wanted to show you the work as it exists at the moment. Um, there's a possibility it's going to be shown this year for the first time. Um, and I'm very interested in having um, a kind of live element to this work, which I'll talk about in a minute. But basically what I asked people to do was to take a lump of clay, um, sorry, that all hackers that, did, that made these pieces, um, and to form a, a, a shape or a small sculpture um, that would express their interpretation, their experience of technology and networks. And I also asked them to write um, their digital address or name. So most people gave me an email address. Um, and they also chose, many people chose to write a small statement about their object. And this is a technique that I picked up um, from two different sources. Firstly, it's something used by art therapists. It's a Jungian technique, which is supposedly um, able to bypass linear thought patterns. So it's um, a way of accessing areas of the brain that are often suppressed. And it's something that's used um, by th in therapy to, um, to, to look at kind of areas that may be blocked because of some kind of painful association. But the idea is very much to access a more cre kind of creative, um, a more perhaps um, open area that can, the object that's created can, can lead into um, a much richer debate than if somebody just, just was able to describe an experience in it using words. The other um, pathway, that this, the other area this is used in um, is in marketing. The focus groups use this technique to describe new products. So say you have um, a new tin of beans. Um, instead of people describing their, their thoughts about these, this product, what they'd actually do is be given a, a piece of clay each and then asked to make a shape that would express what they thought about that, about that product. Um, and then, and then they, they can use that, that shape to write about themselves and also the uh, marketing analyst would then use those for further analysis. And the idea is you get much richer data from doing that. So what the, the shapes they made, I mean there's about 70 of them at the moment. Um, 
I think they, they're really quite illuminating about the internet. You know, you've got any, anything from the kind of what you might associate with technology, representations of networks of kind of infinite loops, um, to kind of rather abstract shapes. And for me, it's about the journey back to the sort of technological roots of this, from something that sort of looks quite childish, um, perhaps, because we've all done something like this at school, um, to, to something which is extremely sophisticated, which is their knowledge about technology, which of course is something that is increasingly impacting everybody. When I, when I show this, I plan to get analysts to actually write about these objects and give me readings, so there'll be kind of multiple interpretations. Yeah, I see these objects as technological, and I, you know, I like that kind of resist the sort of tension between them as technology and knowledge, uh, and the, and their kind of physicality. And perhaps you could see them as kind of runes or um, ways of predicting the future. Right, this is something quite different now. Um, I want to talk about uh, my life a bit now. Um, I actually work as an IT consultant, and I, want, I put this slide in because um, I wanted to kind of explain to you a bit about that. Um, I work for a big multinational IT company, um, and I took that job partly not just because of the money, but also because um, I was very interested in kind of potentially creating some kind of collaboration between myself and um, some IT consultants. Uh, it's a bit of a crazy idea, and I certainly haven't managed to make that happen. But what has what has happened to me on route is that I've got completely fascinated in the culture of this company, um, not only um, uh, from an IT perspective, but very much from the position of um, what 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 is called what is a corporation and um, what is a system in that sense, um, and what what's the language of that world. And I put this, this slide in to show you um, that they, they have invested in me as an artist, which I think is, is really nice. Um, but also that they did manage to put this um, fire extinguisher under my work, um, which irritated me no end. But I, I wanted to very much stress to you that my work is not about trying to be anti-corporate. I'm not taking an anti-corporate position, but I'm very much interested in um, the notion of being an insider or an outsider to that world, because I believe that we're all actually insiders to it, even though it seems like some secret society to those that don't form part of that sphere. So this is a sneak preview into work that I'm doing at the moment. Um, I've been taking photographs at, at clients' events, and uh, kind of hospitality, corporate hospitality events, asking other people to take photographs. Um, <clears throat> it's very much about kind of merging with that world. There's, there's quite a few in this series, but I just put a few in. Right. This is another piece of work. 
um, which is actually an internet project, but because I'm so deeply untechnological, these slides are actually um, slides of a printout. That's how much I don't like the internet. Um, <clears throat> so what I actually did um, was got some money. I was given some money by um, a public arts funding body as a commission um, to make an internet project. So what I did was invested it on the stock market. So here's a still from one of the web pages with the check that was given to me. This is public money. And what I actually did was invested it in two companies um, that are on the, listed on uh, the American stock exchanges uh, under two different symbols. One is art and one is life. So that's not their name, their company names, but that's their symbol, their, their name that they trade under on the stock exchange. Every, every company, every corporation has a symbol like this. So um, many artists are investigating the gap between art and life. Um, and this is my interpretation of that theme. So what the work actually does is track the progress of the shares and, and art and life kind of compete against each other on a daily basis. Hmm. Oh dear. Shall I go back? Uh, is it? All oh, right, okay. Thought I put the other ones in there. Okay, what happens in this is basically, um, it's a, if anybody wants the URL, I can give it to them at the end. Um, you can look, you've spent, the, the whole site is designed around taking different views of the, of the portfolio that I created. So um, you can check how they're doing on a daily basis. You can look at analyst reports on the companies and their interpretations of art and interpretations of life. Um, you can look at the debts that are owed by the companies. Um, very much about buying into corporations but, but still managing to create art. So our next, I want to show you a video next. So if, if you could um, switch the slides off. This is, this is now performance work that I did um, last spring. Can I, before you start it, before you play it, could I just say something? Um, what this actually is, is something, um, it's a new venture for me, which is performance, but um, I'm using my own um, job now as a kind of um, inspiration for my practice. So, well, I actually at work teach clients um, about technology. Um, and as part of that, I'm performing every day, basically. I'm standing in front of a, a bunch of people and talking. Um, and I got really interested in the notion of being in that environment, in the, in the corporate world, um, and being a performer. Um, and I happened to go past the speaker's corner on the coach one day and saw everyone on ladders um, standing up in front of the crowd preaching, if you like, about politics and religion and things like that. Um, and I thought, my God, that's exactly what I do. But, um, you know, I'm doing it in a, in a corporate environment. So I thought, why don't I go to Speaker's Corner and deliver some kind of corporate speech? Um, and would people feel offended by that? Because there's so much kind of anti-corporate feeling around. So um, w would people take to that? Because, after all, Speaker's Corner is very much about free speech. Um, so this, this is now um, a piece about communications and about public space and about um, what people feel is appropriate in terms of democracy. Um, and it's also, I guess, about what the artist, what's appropriate for artists to do. So if you could play the tape. And switch the sound up, please. If you could switch it right up. Oh, thank you, thank you. Hello, my name's Kerry Young, and I'd like to talk to some of you about presentation skills. I'd like to teach you about presentation skills. If you'd like to gather round, I can teach you about presentation skills. Hello, 
My name is Carrie Young and I'd like to teach you about presentation skills today. Uh, we're in a place which is very famous for public speaking, but you probably would feel a bit nervous about getting up here until I've given you these skills which you need to know. And public speaking, can, you can see it as a hobby, it's something that happens here on Sundays, but um, you could also use it uh, in business. If you're in business, you'll be very used to making presentations as a matter of course. Presentation skills can be very useful in terms of just giving you confidence right across your whole life. Uh, if you're a shy person or a self-conscious person, having these skills will really help you get over those problems. And also you'll learn how to convince people about anything, any of your ideas, just to convince them about you as a person. And I personally believe that everyone can learn these skills and everyone can be a public speaker. There's really no mystique to it. You just need some practice and these basic skills. Now just imagine that you're, somebody's asked you to give a presentation. It could be a speech or perhaps you've got a job interview coming up and you're going to be speaking to a panel uh, and they need to hear about you and your background. We're talking about the same skills here. It's the same, um, same kind of things that you need. And really... There's just three basic factors that you need to think about. There's a lot of mystique around public speaking. There's been a lot written about it over the years, but really I think you only need to remember three things. The first and most important thing is to be very aware of who your audience is. You need to actually do some homework about who you're going to be talking to, and you need to also um, Think about their own professional background. Do they already understand the subject matter that you're talking about? Uh, do they perhaps know more than you or the same level? Or are they completely new to it? And do you need to adjust your language to suit them? Each of these needs a different approach. But if you are even just aware of your audience and who they are, you will be doing much better than most public speakers who really don't seem to care very much. Uh, you also need to think about how big your audience is going to be. If it's just five people, you can be very informal. But above about 20 people, what we call crowd, uh, crowd dynamics, crowd psychology, uh, starts to happen. And that's where people just naturally sense they're part of a group. And they would want to be treated more formally. Uh, if you don't do that as a speaker, you'll get a very bad feeling between you and the crowd. Uh, you need to be very aware of who is in your audience. Do people know each other or are they strangers? Are they colleagues? Is there a good group dynamic? Is the boss in the audience? Do, um, do they need to be careful about what they laugh at? Do you have to be a bit more rigid about what jokes you say or can you relax? And also you need to think about the age uh, of your audience, the gender split, the ethnic split, all these things. Uh, you'd need to be very sensitive to so you don't offend anybody. Um, also, you need to think very much when you're giving a presentation about what your audience actually wants to hear. They've probably come to actually hear you say something. And at the very least, you're taking up their time, so you do need to give them something. You must find out what they need to know, what they want to know, and make sure, at the very least, that you've covered that. Uh, to become a really good public speaker, you need to go beyond understanding. You need to go beyond just getting people to hear what you're saying to a level where you're actually able to change what they think, uh, change their perceptions. Once you can do that, you'll know you're quite a powerful speaker. You need to also be able to give your audience something useful. You are giving them a gift, you're giving them information. Um, it's got to be useful to them. Now the next factor that you really should be aware of is the content of your presentation. What is your message? You need just one. Uh, you can boil any good speech down to one basic message which has been used as the spine throughout all the information as a way of organising it uh, and bringing it into something that everybody can understand simply. And you need to remember that whether you're the world expert on your topic or not. You cannot hope to boil down all your expertise into one short presentation. So don't even bother trying. It's going to just confuse people. Uh, and you need to be very aware of the last factor that I'm going to talk about now, which is how you come across as a speaker. You need to be very aware of the way your total communication, uh, only 7% of your communication actually comes from what you say. The rest of it is from your body language and how you actually look and also the tone of your voice. So you need to 
actually practice in front of a mirror and also in front of friends who are quite willing to be critical of you and be honest. Uh, and you need to know how a changed behaviour actually feels so you can be, be different and notice. You, uh, that's all you need to know. That's three factors. That's, that's the basic points. Who's your audience? What do they want to know? What is your message? And how do you come across as a speaker? And once you know those things, you will be a good public speaker and you'll have those skills. So you can see how easy it actually is. Now, has anybody got any questions? Can you switch the tape off, please? Thanks, that's it. Well, I think we've got enough time for just a couple of questions, really. And I think everyone's quite keen to sort of start moving on. Yes. Beautifully timed. What a beautifully timed lecture we've just done. Um, has anyone got any questions? Anyone at the back? What happened to what was a mud? Uh, and I had a great question prepared, and I've forgotten what it was now. Um, 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 um. Uh, uh. Any offers from the audience at all? What will, <laughs> yeah, what happened to all the missing slides? <laughs> well, if there's nothing, absolutely nothing? No? Okay, fine. Well, I'd like to thank all our speakers. Um, thank you for the very uh, interesting and entertaining uh, 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 and very provocative bits of work there. And I love them all. Um, and, well, thank you to the speakers. Thank the audience for turning up and... Uh, uh, I'm very self-conscious now of the whole process of giving a presentation, so I will stop there. Right. Thanks so much.